Okay. What's up, guys? All right, good. How you guys doing? Romans 10 9. This is probably the 50,000th time you've asked me about John 17 3. I've been in discussion with a Muslim about John 17 3. I wrote out a full response using a lot of your words and scriptures, one on one series. Why would you ask me permission whether you can use my stuff? Why do you think we do this, Romans 10 9? My precious brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think we do this? Why do you think I'm doing sessions? Why do you think I'm writing articles? If not to be used of the Holy Spirit of the living God, who doesn't need us, but uses us, right? <clears throat> to strengthen the body of believers, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm your servant for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to ask me. As long as you're not charging people for this information, but you're disseminating it freely for the glory of Jesus Christ because you love Jesus and want to see people get saved. Don't ask me. Do it. The articles are yours. The sessions are yours, provided you use it to bring Jesus Christ glory, to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, provided you don't misquote, misinterpret, and you don't make money. Right, Romans 10, 9? Are you with me? Is everyone hearing that? I just want to make sure. Everyone heard what I just said? Okay, do you hear what I just said? I hope people listen to this. You do not need permission from me or even David Wood because David Wood has gone on record to print out our stuff, distribute, it, distribute our articles, or to download our videos to your YouTube channels. You do that. Do it. Why do you think we're doing it? We're doing it, hopefully, by the grace of God's spirit as the Lord Jesus cleanses and purifies our hearts and motives. To bless you, the people of God, to strengthen you, the people of God, to know the word, to love the word, to live out the word and share it with others. So go ahead, man. Don't ask me. Don't wait for my permission. Do it. But remember, freely you receive, freely you shall give. You don't put a price on it, right? Yeah, don't ask. Just do it, man. Just do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Just do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. I hope... You're listening, and my sound is clear. And again, I'm in my brother's apartment. Pray for him, Sal. The Lord Jesus bless him. He was there in my time of need. It's a one-bedroom apartment that I've been staying with, staying in, staying with him for a year. But Lord Jesus willing, God has set me free. I leave next Wednesday to another state, starting a new chapter in my life. I'm going by faith in Jesus, my God, my Lord, whom I'm unworthy to serve, but he is faithful that he'll be with me, he will provide for me, he will sustain me, he will save me from these trials and save my daughters for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So thank you, Medic for Christ, because I've been shocking JW with your material on the streets. Sam, God bless you. Praise Jesus Christ. Everything good is from the Lord, right? So pray that the Lord will take me to a higher level, a higher level of holiness, of righteousness, of purity, of obedience, of service, service of love, of devotion, of worship, higher level of knowledge, wisdom, understanding of his word, more boldness, more love, more compassion, more mercy, more patience, to get healthier, I need to get healthier, to provide financially, to take care of myself and my children for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So use the material for the glory of Christ and pray. As you can see genetically, I've never had white shoulders, so hopefully when I settle in, I can be more disciplined and getting physically fit as I try to get spiritually fit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 10, 9, here's a passage for you, for me, for everyone who is born of the Spirit, united to the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 10, verse 9. Amen, King of Kings. Amen. Romans 10, verse 9. Sorry. His name is Romans 10, 9. See what you're doing? Lord Jesus, grant me clarity of thought. Loosen my tongue to speak by the power of the Holy Spirit for your glory, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Wash us, purify us, cleanse us in your holy blood, Lord Jesus. Please, we love you, Lord Jesus. We're in love with you, and we need you in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. The buffering again. Yeah, Allah, Yem Shikha, Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay, it was buffering. Uh, well, hopefully it's okay now. 
Pray for the internet connectivity in Jesus' name. Go smooth. Right? Okay. Not Romans 10, 9. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Yep, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Let's look at it. May the Lord Jesus purify us for his glory and fill us with the Holy Spirit and beatify us in Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, and Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Romans 10, 9, everyone else, I want you to remember this passage and ask the Holy Spirit to give us the power, power to model this passage by the power of the Holy Spirit as he loosens my tongue, saves me from stammering, confusion, from error in Jesus' name. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Okay. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We don't talk about ourselves. We don't boast about ourselves. We don't talk about our achievements. We preach, we proclaim, we glorify Christ Jesus as Lord of all creation and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Did you catch it? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Did you catch it, guys? Hopefully you get nearly 200 in Jesus' name. Well, unfortunately, if I start talking, I'm going to end up becoming the very thing I hate in this other individual. But you guys get an idea. There's an individual that cannot help start every show by talking about his achievements and how great he is. What a gift he is, right? Which makes him repulsive, but God have mercy on him and heal my heart. Not to hate anyone, but to love for the sake of Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. One more time, let's read it. For we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord. It's all about him, making him known, glorifying him, being used of the Holy Spirit to bring others to fall in love with him and that we ourselves fall, fall more passionately in love, more passionately in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake, right? Everyone there? Model this passage in Jesus' almighty name. Model this passage in Jesus' almighty name. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Now here, let me teach you something about <clears throat> ministry. Okay, folks, I'm going to take a few minutes to prepare us. We'll begin in prayer, and then we'll begin the session. Yes, I'm Assyrian, Ashuraya. I've been Assyrian since my conception in the, in the womb of my mother. All right? Matthew 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Did you catch it? What did the Lord Jesus Christ tell the disciples? All of these blessings I've given to you free of charge. I have bestowed all these graces upon you freely. It didn't cost, cost you anything. Therefore, you do likewise. You don't charge for ministry, right? You with me there? Are you with me there? You don't charge for ministry. Hold on a second. You don't put a price on ministry. Hold on. Okay. Sorry about that. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't charge you. Right? Didn't charge you. For all these blessings, graces, and privileges, he paid it all and freely gave it to you out of his infinite love, his grace, and mercy for us. Likewise, you don't put a price. You don't put a price. In other words, you do have people. Now, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> there are people who are barely making it financially and can't afford, let's say, a plane ticket to make it to your church. The very least thing you can do is pay their traveling expenses. But I know people, I won't mention, I won't mention names. I know people who will not come to your church unless you pay them a hefty sum. Some demand anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 just to come speak at a church. Shame on them. The Lord Jesus in his love rebuke and chasten them. Because that's not what Jesus said. Freely you receive, freely you give. Yes, I know this. I'm not going to mention names. I know. I know who they are, right? $5,000 to $10,000. 
freely received, freely you shall give. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 8, right? That's why I love David Wood. That's why I love Vocab Malone. That's why I love John Meme. That's why I love Anthony Rogers. They don't put a price. They may ask just to pay for their, let's say, airplane ticket. That's why I love Usama Dagdok. I love that man. He doesn't charge a dime. He gets in his car and by faith he travels from state to state, sometimes driving over 11 hours to teach at small churches for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? You with me there? Now, with that said, all our materials are free. Don't ask again. One thing we do ask is you don't sell them and you don't change and edit them to make us say something we did not say. Are you with me there? In Jesus' name, bless the internet connecti connectivity. Please, Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Loosen my tongue. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You with me there? Okay. Now, notice, as a minister, I can't put a price. However, notice what the Lord Jesus Christ tells believers. Notice what the Lord Jesus Christ tells those who are receiving a blessing from the ministers of the gospel. Matthew 10.10. 10. Matthew 10.10. 10. Watch here. Matthew 10.10. 10. Nor per, take your purse. Script means purse. That's fine, Gerard, Gerard Perry. Tell your pastor, let him change it to King James Version. David Wood would not mind. So don't need to ask. Do it for the glory of Jesus. Okay, but now, nor take a purse. This is Jesus Christ our Lord instructing the apostles as he's sending them out two by two in their mission field. Pay attention. I want you to learn this. Nor script, nor purse for your journey. Don't take a purse for your journey, right? Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. For the workman is worthy of his meat. You know what he means here? Don't worry about providing for yourself financially or don't worry about taking provisions for your ministry because I will make sure that when you go to a place, there'll be people there who will take care of you and feed you, welcome you into their homes for my sake. You get it here? Let's go to Luke 10 verses 5 to 7. Luke 10 verses 5 to 7. Luke 10, verses 5 to 7. And believe me, if you want to get rich, you don't do ministry. You don't do ministry to get rich, meaning financially. You do ministry to get spiritually rich to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, Luke 10, 5 to 7. And into whatsoever house you enter, whatever house welcomes you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, meaning a man of peace, your peace shall rest upon it. Meaning if there's someone who is peaceful, who accepts your peace, who accepts your greeting, who accepts you for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that peace, that pronounce, uh, pronouncement of blessing, of peace, will remain in that house. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Did you catch it? See what our Lord said? He will make sure that wherever you go, he will put in the hearts of people who love Jesus Christ or whose heart had been opened to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ to welcome you in, feed you, clothe you, and give you a place of lodging. So though we don't put a price, look at the, how amazing Jesus is. The Lord has set it up where I don't put a price on my preaching, but he will make sure to touch and move the hearts of his servants the people I visit by his spirit to then provide for me, for my travels, for my lodging. And so in Galatians 6, verse 6, notice what Paul says. Galatians 6, verse 6. Let's see what he says here. Galatians 6, verse 6. Watch here. Let him that is taught in the word, meaning... You who are being taught the word by men of God, appointed by the Spirit. 
Communicate. Communicate. You know what communicate means here? Communicate. What does communicate mean here? Unto him that teacheth in all good things. What does communicate mean? So that's why we got to catch up on our old English, Shakespearean English. Communicate means share. If you're being taught the word of God, then share, right? Give. Give graciously, generously to the one who's teaching you. You get my point? You see how the Lord Jesus set it up? The ministers cannot charge because as this man, gentleman said, we are stewards of these gifts. We are stewards of these talents. These gifts do not originate from us. It originates from the triune God and we are stewards of his property, his gifts, his talents, and we are to use those gifts and talents in accord with his will, according to his good pleasure, and discharge these gifts, disseminate these talents for the glory of Jesus, to build up believers, to get people saved, and we don't charge a dime. But then the Lord Jesus, then the Lord Jesus put the responsibility on those who are being fed, being taken care of, being nourished by these ministers to then take care of the ministers financially. You catch it here? Yep, and hit that like button, man. Come on. We got nuisances coming. So you got you got it there? Why did this come up? Because, again, I want to explain. You do not need, right? Hold on a second. Okay, you do not need <clears throat> to ask me again. You do not need to ask me again whether you can download these sessions, whether you can copy and paste my materials, print them out, use them to teach or pass them to others. You have my full permission provided you don't charge you don't edit them and make us say something we did not say. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? Don't ask me again. Do it. But do pray for us because, again, though we don't put a price and we won't put a price, we are in full-time ministry and we're trusting the grace of Jesus to move the hearts of the church of Jesus Christ to provide our needs we're not doing it from to get rich financially. We're not, honestly. My friend, if we wanted to be rich financially, we wouldn't be in ministry. It's one of the hardest fields because here's the thing. Here's the danger. And I want to get into the topic by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to pray for us that God will purify our hearts, sanctify our hearts, save us from the lust of money, the lust of fame, and the fear of finances. Because what can happen is this. For the sake of... Filthy lucre, money. <clears throat> there is always the tendency that you're going to be a crowd pleaser, tickle ears and compromise, lest you push people away from supporting you financially. There's always that danger. Pray in Jesus' almighty name. By the blood of Jesus washing us, washing me, and the Spirit sealing us, we never do that. And in my case, I don't have to worry about that. I offend everybody, right? I offend everybody. So, man, me? Woo. That's why David Wood says, if you weren't such a jerk, maybe you get more people to support you. And he's the biggest jerk the world has ever seen. He just knows how to mask it, Hater Wood. Yeah, that's you, Hater Wood. But anyway, Father, we love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. Sanctify us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus and forgive us for failing and succumbing to our flesh. Forgive me. Crucify our flesh and give us victory over the flesh to walk in the life of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with fruit of the Holy Spirit. And Father, please anoint my mouth to speak clearly without error. Save me from stammering, confusion, and misinterpretation. Anointed by your Spirit, 
Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your children, Father, purchased by the blood of Jesus, sealed by your spirit. And give me wisdom and knowledge into the scriptures to bless the people of God, to stand in awe of you. And of the Lord Jesus and of the Holy Spirit, and to be more in love with our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Save us from the distractions of the evil one. And please, Father, be with me in my journey. Father, we are dust, we are weak, we are fragile, and we are afraid. I'm afraid, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for having imperfect faith and trust. We believe, help our unbelief, and give us power to do wonders for the glory of Jesus Christ. And please fight for my children, love my children, seal my children, bring them to me, Father. So they know they have a Bob on earth who loves them. Wash them, blood of Jesus Christ, and provide for them. And for their sake, Father, save me from these trials. For their sake, not for mine. I deserve wrath. My God, we love you. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay. If there are trolls, the admins, bounce them. Don't even wait. We don't want distractions. We just want people who are sincere and want to learn and want to grow in love with the triumph God and his word, the Holy Bible. Now, as you can see, <clears throat> the title is Jesus, the true Israel of God. Now, why did I title this? Now, please pray for me. I don't become the very thing I hate. Ask the Lord Jesus to save me from hypocrisy and not be the very thing I hate. And ask God to heal my heart, not to have hate towards any brother, right? <clears throat> but to be Jesus, right? <sighs> to even those who I personally dislike. The reason why I'm saying this is because I, I watched the debate between James White and this former Mormon who became an evangelical Christian who's now apostatized. He's become an apostate. And he's pretty much spewing the same filth and lies of Rabbi Tovia Singer, right? Rabbi <clears throat> Tovia Singer. Send Jude Klappa to Hades where he belongs with his father, the devil, this dog that's barking. Okay. Yes, I just saw it last night. And to be quite honest, to be quite honest. I was disappointed, and if I, I'm going to be honest, I was disgusted with the debate. You know, I mean, the gentleman was all over the place, quite passionate, but not very coherent or organized. But the answers that James White gave in the debate, how do I say this? And I don't want to sound like I hate the guy and I have a vendetta against the guy. May God heal my heart. It was pathetic, and his way of arguing for the preservation of the New Testament and his argument for the Trinity is more faith destroying than faith building. It was disastrous for me. It was disastrous. I'm sorry. I know people thought James White schooled him, but if you actually pay attention, James White made certain candid admissions that pretty much will destroy the confidence <clears throat> one has in God's preservation of his word, the Holy Bible. He, he pretty much admitted Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, are interpolations. They were added to the gospel of Mark, and that Mark actually ended at verse 8. And he pretty much stated he does not believe that the apostle John wrote the story of the woman caught in adultery. John 7, 53 to 8, 11, because James White has bought into the modern theories of textual criticism, modern textual criticism that's actually more faith destroying than faith building, right? But put that aside, that was bad enough. What made it worse is this gentleman threw, threw at him the typical objections of Tovia Singer and, and, and other anti-Christ, rabbinic Jews who hate Jesus and blaspheme him and make a living blaspheming their God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Same typical arguments from the Hebrew Bible, and James White was completely inept at responding to his objections. Inept. In fact, it got so bad that at the closing statements, he actually had to appeal to Michael Brown. My good friend Michael Brown would shred these arguments. Yeah, I know he would, James. Why can't you? 
And if you can't, then why are you debating these topics? You with me there? It got so bad that he had to say in the closing statements, my good friend, Dr. Michael Brown, so he has to plug that again, right? You know, he's my friend, right? Would shred these objections. Okay, we know he can. Why can't you? And if you can't, then why are you engaging these topics? It was cringeworthy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take his objections by the grace of the triune God and answer them. Are you ready? We're going to answer them. So pray the Holy Spirit will guide me to do justice to this topic, to do it reverently and to protect me from error, because you're going to learn how to interpret the Old Testament. Right? You're going to learn how the Jews at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ interpreted the Old Testament. And we find the Lord Jesus and his Jewish followers adopting these same principles of hermeneutics, the same principles that the Jews were employing in viewing the Old Testament as not only sacred history, but as an entire prophetic picture of future events. Are you with me? Milos, then you don't understand Michael Brown's MO. Paul quoted pagan Greeks, Greek pagan poets and philosophers to prove his point. I cite Jesus denying, God hating, Bible perverting Muslims and the Quran, citing them to prove your point. There's nothing wrong with that. Michael Brown is following the example of the blessed apostles who, would, who did the same thing. So don't attack Brown for doing that. Okay? That's something we find in scripture. But with that said, here's the objection. Let's go to Matthew 2, 14 and 15. Let me set up the objection, and then we're going to learn, by the grace of God, how to interpret scripture. Are you ready? How to interpret scripture. And these are things I learned from Jewish believers in Jesus. These are things I learned from professors of Old Testament theology. I didn't invent these things. Matthew 2, 14 and 15. Matthew 2, 14, 15. Why? I don't know what you mean. Don't ask questions we can't disagree with. I, I'm confused there. Let's read now. Read with me, guys. Focus. When he arose, he took the young child. Pay attention. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Go listen to the debate. The apostate, the heretic, who now denies Jesus and blasphemes Jesus, kept saying, here Matthew misquotes Hosea 11, verse 1. Notice what Matthew did. Guys, I need you to make sure you're understanding the point. Matthew says that when Joseph took the Lord Jesus Christ into Egypt and then subsequently took him out of Egypt, that fulfilled the prophecy of Hosea 11, verse 1, where God says, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, Let's go to Hosea 11, verse 1, to see it's not about Jesus. It's not about the Messiah. Okay. Guys, don't be distracted with side talk. Focus. It is what the devil does. He wants you to get distracted. Focus for the glory of Jesus so you can learn. Here's the passage at Matthew cites. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So the objection goes like this, folks. The objection goes like this. Hosea is talking about Israel, the nation, being taken out of Egypt and brought into the promised land because God loves Israel as a son. How then could Matthew take a, a statement about the past and claim it's a prophecy about the future, specifically about Jesus being led into Egypt and subsequently taken out of Egypt? See, Matthew's butchering the Old Testament how can this be the word of God? You understand the objection? Do you understand the objection? Because now I'm going to show you how prophecy works. Okay. Save these links. Lord willing, I'll put them in the description box. Link number one. Save that. Link number one. Save that. Okay. Link number two. Save it. Okay. 
if you want to understand how the Old Testament was interpreted and understood by the Jews, then it is vitally important that you look into Jewish sources to see how they viewed prophecy and sacred history. Now, I got this information from Jewish believers in Jesus who got this information from rabbinic Jewish sources. And I also got it from professors of Old Testament theology who are well-versed in the Jewish literature. So this is stuff that is common knowledge to rabbinic Jews, <clears throat> which is part and parcel of rabbinic Judaism. I'm not making it up. I want you to remember this acronym. And I got this from Dr. David Stern's Jewish New Testament commentary, a must read resource for serious students of the Bible, serious students of the Bible and apologists. You have to get Dr. David Stern's Jewish New Testament commentary. You can get it on Amazon. I want you to remember this acronym, okay? Pardes. Okay. Pardes. Pardes is a Jewish acronym. And it it's it's an acronym that gives us an idea of how the Jews interpret the Old Testament. The P in the Pardes is Pshat. Pshat. Okay. It's all in my article. Let me just cross reference. Oh, let me just when. Let me just, uh, yeah, literal interpretation. Okay. Pshat. Okay. Pshat means literal interpretation. Pshat means, Milos, you know you're going to get blocked, right? We're going to send you on your merry way and you're never going to return to this page. Pshat, the Hebrew word shot means simple. This refers to <clears throat> a literal approach in interpreting scripture. Are you with me there? Shot means the literal interpretation interpretation of the verse. Just taking the verse at face value. Are you with me there? Or am I confusing you? Make sure you're getting this. This is in all those articles. Okay. Drash or midrash. This is an allegorical approach to interpreting scripture allegorizing statements in the Old Testament, taking, let's say, historical events and allegorizing them. Are you with me there? Angela, it's in my articles as well. You with me there? Are you getting, you understand what these means? In other words, the Jews would either interpret the scriptures using shot, the literal approach, or they would use drash or midrash, the allegorical approach, and there was other ways of interpreting scripture. Here's another one. Remez. Remez. Okay. Remez. This approach seeks to find the word, phrase, or other element in the text that provides hints for a specific event. In other words, the Jews believe that in the Old Testament, there were hints encoded in the scriptures that point to future events. This is called remez. Remez. Okay. Okay, and then finally, sod. Sod means secret, secret, and this seeks to find the mystical, mystical meaning of scripture. A form of mystical meaning of scripture is mm, gematria, gematria, or gematria. I gave you the link. Gematria, right, <clears throat> is a study of biblical numerics biblical numerology specifically when it comes to the letters of the hebrew consonant because remember both hebrew and greek do not have numerals the letters represent numbers like aleph would represent the uh, uh, number one beth number two and on and on it goes so what they do is they look at the letters as containing secret mystical meanings and so they try to find their mystical meanings, right? This is also something you find in the Kabbalah, the Zohar. 
where they try to look for the deeper mystical meanings of the letters, the phrases, the words. That's known as Saad. Exactly, Kabbalah. Now, you have to be careful because, unfortunately, you can take these methods of interpreting the Old Testament and abuse and misuse them to make the Bible say things it wasn't intended to say. So you have to be careful because you can take this acronym and these different approaches to interpreting the scripture and run with them to justify any and every perverted misinterpretation, misapplication of the Bible. So you need to be careful with this approach. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? So here you got an idea that the Jews, not Jesus, not the apostles, the Jews would approach the Old Testament and interpret it through these various methods, these various lenses. So they would look for an allegorical meaning to passages, or they would look for prophetic hints in the words and the phrases, or even a deeper mystical secret meaning that they believed was embedded in the text, right? These are the methods that the Jews came up with, and we find the Lord Jesus and his apostles using those methods in the New Testament. Are you with me there? Now, before I move on, I'm going to now quote Dr. James D. Price, an outstanding professor of Old Testament theology, in his response to an atheist named Pharaoh Till, whom he schooled, he schooled him, right, in their online written debate. And in the online written debate, which you'll find uh, in the article, I link to it, as he's responding to these objections, Pharaoh Till used similar objections to show that the New Testament is butchering the Old Testament. And he states, and I quote, the ancient Jews had 32 rules for interpreting scripture. Guys, pay attention. And I trust the Holy Spirit to guide me to understand this material and present it clearly. I don't want to confuse you. The ancient Jews had 32 rules for interpreting scripture. These were first collected and published by the second century rabbi. Second century, a rabbi, after the spread of Christianity, Eliezer ben Josi, the Galilean. Notice, Galilee of all places. The seventh rule. Out of these 32 rules of interpreting scriptures, the seventh rule declares, pay attention, that inferences may be made from analogy and parallel passages. Inferences may be made from analogy and parallel passages. And he quotes the McClintock Strong Cyclopedia of Biblical Theology and Ecclesiastical Literature, Volume 6, pages 243 to 246, under their section called Halakhic and Haggadic Rules of Interpretation. Lord, loosen my tongue. Now, Dr. Price mentions <clears throat> three particular methods employed by the Jews, their rabbis, in interpreting Scripture. Three. Now, I'm going to repeat them to you. Number one, direct specific statements like we Westerners expect, right? That's that's the shot, the literal approach, the literal interpretation. The second, the second way they would look at scripture, interpret scripture, prophecy by analogy, meaning a past event serves as an analogy for a future event. Prophecy by analogy, acts of Israel or God that typify, typify, typify the point to the Messiah. Okay. Third. Prophecy by similarity, ancient events that are prophetically similar to later events. So something happened in the past that's similar to what happens in the future. Something in the future is similar to what happened in the past. And a past event serves as an analogy for a future event. Are you guys with me? I'm not here to bore you, but I'm here to educate you by the grace of God. And I want you to understand. If we're going to talk about Japan, I'm going to send some of you to Japan so you can stay there and I'll take away your visas and your passports. What has Japan got to do with Israel, with Jerusalem? So let me repeat again. You have prophecy by similarity. This event is similar to 
something that takes place in the future. Prophecy by analogy. This event becomes an analogy of something in the future. Everyone with me there? Do you understand? The different ways that the rabbinic Jews interpreted the Hebrew Bible. No, someone mentioned Japan. Medic mentioned Japan. Everyone understand, right? In other words, when the Jews looked at the Old Testament, they didn't simply look for direct prophetic statements saying, in the future, such and such person will arise. In the future, such and such event will take place. That was one type of prophecy. They also looked at sacred history as providing analogies to future events that they were experiencing or were similar to things that they were undergoing. What we call prophecy by analogy and prophecy by similarity or prophecy by type. Is that clear? No, I'm not going to explain that, Lori. Don't bring up issues that don't seem to be related will get me off topic. Let's focus. Is it clear before I move on? Because I'm going to give you examples from the New Testament where the Lord Jesus and his apostles employed these methods of interpreting the Hebrew Bible. Okay. Let me give you a prophecy by analogy. John 3, 14. You can even say it's a prophecy by similarity. Sometimes the distinction between these two types of prophecies are very slim. Because something that's analogous is also similar. Something that's similar is also analogous, right? John 3, 14. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Do you see what kind of prophecy that is? You see what our Lord is doing? Saying that event is an analogy of what will happen to Christ when he's lifted on the cross. You catch it? This is prophecy by analogy. I want to see if you guys see it. Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. Watch here. Andrew, I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. I hope you guys are not falling asleep, especially Zena. She likes to be yelled at. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's be belly, so shall. See, Jonah serves as a picture of what will happen to Jesus. He's an analogy to what will happen to Jesus, right? He's a type of Christ. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Do you see it? Are you seeing how they're using these different prophetic types, prophetic methods, interpretive methods that the Jews came up with that the Lord Jesus and his apostles are amening because they're employing them too because they were Jews? Are you seeing this? Oh, but it's not only the Lord Jesus. Okay. What does Paul say about Adam? Romans 5.14. So I'm going to have to do a multi-part series on this because I'm not going to finish it in one session. Romans 5, 14. Speaking of Adam, Adam is what? Amen and amen, Robert. Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Did you catch it? Adam is a figure, a picture of someone else to come. Exactly, Andrew Martin. Andrew Martin's going to be worshiping the Trinity soon. Watch in Jesus' name. Guy knows too much. Yeah. The guy knows too much. I just buffered slightly. In Jesus' name. He's going to fall in love with the Trinity. The guy knows too much not to be in love with God. Did you catch it? Adam is a picture of Christ. Adam is a picture of Christ. I hope he does. That means he's in love with Jesus if he takes over my job. Right? Do you see it? Okay, now let's go to Hebrews 7.3. Hebrews 7.3. Pay attention now. Hebrews 7.3. Okay. 
without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Aphemoyo, made like unto the Son of God, resembling the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Melchizedek was deliberately depicted, portrayed, pictured as a type of Christ. Do you see it there? Do you catch it? Are you seeing the New Testament using prophecy by analogy, prophecy by type, prophecy by similarity? Are you seeing it? So that the New Testament is endorsing these methods of interpreting the Old Testament that the rabbinic Jews came up with. See, Hebrews 7.13, and then Hebrews 7.15. Hebrews 7.15, sorry, I just kicked my thing, sorry. Hebrews 7.15, as the Lord Jesus grants me recall. Don't ask me an unrelated question, Jeremy, unless you want me to change topic, talk about Melchizedek. Focus on the theme. That's another thing I have a hard time with Christians. We're talking about a theme. They bring up issues that they think are related that will take me off course. Guys, discipline yourself to stay focused. Hebrews 7.15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Did you catch it? Jesus comes after the similitude likeness of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a similitude of Jesus. You see how it's working? Are you seeing this? The entire temple, sacrificial system, the priesthood, all of it, all of it was designed to be a picture pointing to something greater, right? <clears throat> Foreshadowing something greater. All of it, according to the New Testament. Here. Let's go to Hebrews 8, verse 5. Hebrews 8, verse 5. Yes, the tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, Moses, Aaron, Solomon, all of it. So, guys, I'm going to have to do a multi-part series here to whet your appetite because we're going to go into meat by the power of the Holy Spirit. Who served, talking about the earthly priests. Guys, pay attention. Earthly priests, priests on earth in Jerusalem at the time of the wedding Hebrews, they serve unto the example and shadow. That temple that they're serving is, is an example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he's about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Did you catch it? Hebrews is saying the earthly tabernacle and temple was a shadow, right? An example of something greater, something with this, which is the reality, the temple in heaven. Do you see it there? The temple itself, the tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrificial system, Aaron as the high priest, Moses as the all of them. All of them, their stories, events in their lives, all of it is designed to point to the greater reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You with me so far? Hebrews 10, verse 1. Hebrews 10, verse 1. Yep. Tradition says Paul wrote it and would have used a secretary, most possibly Luke, because they say the Greek of Hebrews is a lot like the Greek of Luke and Acts. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Do you understand what you're being told? You're being told by the New Testament writers, go back now and read the Old Testament as a shadow of greater realities now being fulfilled at the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, Death, resurrection, outpouring of the Spirit, and the birth of the church. So now what you're supposed to do is go back and look for those shadows, look for those figures, look for those types, look for those analogies, look for those hints. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. Colossians 2, 16 to 17. 
Exactly, unmasking fools. You got it. You 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 hit it on a, the nail. The law was pre, was designed to prepare the Jews for Jesus, our God and Savior. Okay. Okay. Colossians 2, 16, 17. Guys, pay attention now because I'm going to start blowing your minds away. You want me? You want me to give you me? I'm going to give you me by the power of the Holy Spirit filling me to bless you. Okay. You guys want me, right? Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in me what you eat or in drink or in respect of any holy day. In other words, the Judaizers, don't let them condemn you that you're not following their customs or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, the reality is Christ. Did you catch it? Paul just told you the eating, the drinking, the holy days, the new moon festivities, the Sabbath days are all shadows of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what you were just told? Even the Sabbaths point to Jesus Christ. The festivities, the holy days of Israel point to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the way you eat, the way you drink points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want me there? No, Duhawu, it's not buffering for us. It's buffering for you. Do you understand now? I want it to sink in before I move on to the next point. It is supernatural, divine, and origin of the Bible. It will blow you away. Now let's go to 1 Peter 3. Let's read 19 to 20. 1 Peter 3, 19 to 20. If anyone's confused, say, hey, I'm confused. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And we're going to read all the way to 21. All the way to 21. Now notice 20, folks. 20. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was, was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Now notice the flood and the ark, according to Peter in 21, is what? The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Did you catch it? The floodwaters, the ark, are a figure, a figure pointing to that baptism, which now saves us, not by cleansing dirt from our body, right? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see what Peter said? Even Noah's ark, even the flood points to Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for our salvation, and are being baptized into him. In Jesus' name, bless the internet connectivity. In Jesus' name. Even the ark of Moses, even the floodwaters, point to Jesus' death, resurrection, for our salvation, and are being baptized into him. Everyone catching this? So the New Testament says everything is meant to point to Jesus Christ. Everything was meant to point to Jesus Christ. In fact, can anyone tell me what connection does a dove have with Noah's flood? What the dove has in connection with Noah's flood? Can anyone tell me? So I forgot to pull that out. Let's see who remembers the flood story, right? It's going to be found in Genesis chapter 8. We're not going to read all of it, right? Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 to 12. No, 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 no. You guys don't remember the dove with Noah? What do you All right. Am I still? I don't know if it's working yet. In Jesus' almighty name, please, my God, Father. Is it okay now? All right. Genesis 8, 6 to 12. We don't need to read it. What's the connection with dove and Noah's flood? 
the dove was the sign that Noah and his family could now walk on dry land because Noah sent out a dove and it returned because it couldn't find a place to, to rest until finally the dove went out and didn't return, indicating to Noah the floodwaters had receded. Now you can walk on dry land. And he just quoted it. Thank Protestant believer, our brother. Everyone with me there? You see verse 12, it says, And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. So now do you make the connection with the dove and Noah and the flood and the dry land? The dove became the sign that Noah could come out of the ark because now the waters had receded. So he can come out of the waters, right, and walk on dry land, correct? Right? And remember, the waters came from the fount of heaven and from the earth, gushed forth from the earth and from heaven, right? The waters of the heaven and the waters of from the fount of the earth Gush forth and covered the earth, right? Okay. Because now let me show you the picture it, point, it paints of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Are you now ready to get into some meat? Are you ready to get into some meat? Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Okay. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Number one. The words, the beginning, should echo, should signal to your mind the Genesis account of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Just like John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? Okay. The words, the beginning, right there, should signal in your mind creation, the beginning of something, like Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1, echoing Genesis 1, 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? <clears throat> he was with God in the beginning, right? All things came into being through him. So the beginning, the beginning, or in Hebrews 1, 10. At the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Hebrews 1.10, citing Psalm 102, 25. At the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. You see it? Beginning, beginning, beginning. You with me there? It is signaling creation. So what is Mark 1 telling us? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, here, here's what he's telling you. Let's go to Mark 1, 9 to 11. Here's what he's telling you. Mark 1, 9 to 11. Mark 1, 9 to 11. And it came to pass in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water... He saw the heavens open. The Greek verb means rent asunder, torn apart. Heavens torn open. And the spirit like a dove descending upon him. This is Mark's way of introducing you to a new creation. The beginning of a new creation. Water, dove, Jesus coming up of the water. A new creation like Noah, water, dove. So Mark is using Old Testament imagery to paint the picture that Jesus Christ is ushering in a new creation. Here is the beginning of the new creation of God, ushered in by Jesus Christ, his son. Nothing is coincidental in this book. The Holy Spirit didn't assume the form of a dove for no reason. He could have assumed any form. Why the form of a dove? Because that's God's way of reminding you of Genesis. Here is now a new work, a work of a new creation that I'm ushering in.
Is it sinking in or no? Before I move on. So, do you see how the New Testament writers are employing the methods of interpreting the Old Testament developed by rabbinic Jews? Remember they have shot the plain reading of the text, drash or midrash, allegorizing the text, right? Remez, finding hints in the text, saw a deeper mystical meaning, and the New Testament writers are employing all of that. Let me show you Paul using... Yeah, Father, Son, Spirit, oh my God, Father, Son, Spirit, my God, we love you, Father, Son, Spirit, we love you, my God, Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Okay, let me show you Paul taking actual historical persons, actual people and their lives and allegorizing them as pointing to something else. Are you ready? Galatians 4, 21 to 26. King of Kings, you pray that Jesus continually blesses me, washes me, fills me with his love, keeps me in love with him and holy unto the Lord and protects me and my children. And I'll continue teaching and blessing you. Galatians 4, 21, 26. Read with me. Okay, read here. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. Do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid. Pay attention to what Paul does with this. The other by a free woman, right? But he who was of the bond, bond woman was born after the flesh, Hagar and Ishmael, okay? But he of the free woman... Sarah was by promise. Which things are an allegory? Here goes Drash and Midrash. Hagar, her son Ishmael, Sarah, her son Isaac, they are allegories. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. Do you see what he just did? He said Hagar is a picture of Mount Sinai in Arabia, which represents the law of Moses, because the law of Moses doesn't free, it enslaves. So Hagar's picture of the law of Moses, right? But then notice what he goes on to say. For this Hagar, verse 25, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answered to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Did you see what he just did? Wow. He said Hagar is a picture, an allegory, of Sinai, Mount Sinai in Arabia, where the law was given to Israel because the, the Jews who still want to live according to law are children in bondage, enslaved to sin, and they're like Ishmael, whereas we, who by grace believe in Jesus, we belong to Sarah, Sarah meaning Heavenly Jerusalem because Sarah is a picture of Heavenly Jerusalem and she's our mother and she gives birth to the children of promise. He just did Drash and Midrash. He just did Drash, Midrash. He allegorized two actual women and their two actual children who actually lived. He allegorized them in order to bring out a deeper spiritual application. Do you guys see it? You got you're seeing this, right? Okay. Isn't it sad, James White? And may God have mercy on this brother and convict him and convict me and save me from my own flesh and pride, right? Doesn't know his limitations and isn't humble enough to avoid debating topics that he shouldn't be debating because he has no expertise and not qualified. Ah, oh, brother, what's going on? I'm on a live stream right now. Oh, never mind that. Can I call you in 10 minutes? Sure. Call me later. Okay, I love you, brother. No God bless you. I love you too. Bye. By the way, Protestant believer that was child of God. Child of God. Jericho Solomon. Every one of us has certain gifts and are gifted in certain areas. 
but we're not gifted in every area. We need to know our limitations and be humble enough to defer to someone else that God has raised up in that particular field. I won't debate atheists, evolutionists, because I'm an ignoramus. I know God exists, but I may not be able to articulate my belief. So I will defer them to someone like William Lane Craig, a theological, philosophical, spiritual, intellectual giant who eats atheists and evolutionists for breakfast. Okay. I will stay in my field, my gifting for the glory of God. This is why God has raised up different members of the body with different giftings. So we all depend on one another, right? And serve one another and do not think that we don't need the other. That's how God has designed it. Okay. So now... Have I now established that these methods of Jewish interpretation are there in the New Testament? Are there in the New Testament? Clearly, right? Okay. Now let's see the Old Testament telling us, the Old Testament telling us that the historical events in the Old Testament are designed to point to greater realities in the future. Do you know that's also in the Old Testament? The Old Testament told you that. Zechariah 3, verse 8. Joshua, the high priest, and his, and his friends, they are all symbols of one to come. Zechariah 3, verse 8. Okay. Hear now, O Joshua, thy priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Wondered at means signs. You are men who are signs of something else. For behold, I'll bring forth my servant, the branch. Do you understand? Wondered at means here. That's why other translations bring it out in a more clear manner for us. Okay. Claudia, you're scaring me because you had left a comment that sounded modalistic where you made Jesus the same person as the Father, and I'm tempted to block you, but still I'll give you a chance. But let's focus here. Joshua the high priest, guys pay attention. Joshua the high priest and his fellows are a wonder, a sign, a symbol of someone called the branch. Right? Zechariah 4.10. Zechariah 4, verse 10. Watch here. Zechariah 4, verse 10. Yes, isn't it amazing? Andrew Martin, who still claims to be an atheist, but at heart, he's in love with Jesus, and he aches for Jesus, and he's going to fall in love with Jesus. In Jesus' name, you're going to come and become a great spiritual giant for Christ. He shows me more love and respect than some Christians. It's amazing. Anyway, Zechariah 4, verse 10. Okay. Walking in the light, you praise the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and you thank Jesus because I am what I am because of his grace and only his grace and his love for me, which I don't deserve, may keep me humble and pure and in love with him. In Jesus' name, and not be a hypocrite. Please, Lord, save me from myself. Save all of us. Save Andrew for your glory, Lord Jesus. Zechariah 4, 10. Okay. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven who are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro the whole earth. You see why I got confused? Zech <laughs> Zechariah 4.10 is a cross-reference to Zechariah 3.9. Computer, work. <laughs> see, even computers have malfunctions. <laughs> Let me reboot. Not Zechariah 4.10. Zechariah 4.10 goes with Zechariah 3.9. Zechariah 3 8 goes with Zechariah 6 12 to 13, but we're going to read Zechariah 6 9 to 15. Zechariah 3 verse 8 goes with Zechariah 6 12 to 13, but we're going to read verses 9 to 15. So here is the cross reference to Zechariah 3 8. Zechariah 4 10 is a cross reference to Zechariah 3 9. So Zechariah 3 8 with Zechariah 6 9 to 15, but pay attention to verses 12 and 13. Okay? Read with me. Read. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Hildai, 
of Tobijah and of Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of jo jo Josedek, the high priest. Guys, pay attention here. Please pay attention. Please read this. Take a crown and put the crown on top of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Crown the high priest as king. Okay. And speak unto him, saying, pay attention now, 12 and 13. Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. There's a man called the branch, which Joshua and his fellows are a wonder at, a sign of, a symbol of. You guys are a symbol of this branch. And he shall grow up out of his place and shall build the temple of Jehovah. Even shall... Even he shall build the temple of Jehovah, the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace will shall be between them. I'll explain what this means in a minute. Now read 14 and 15. And the crown shall be to Helam, to Tobijah and to Jediah and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah for a memorial, a reminder, a reminder of the branch to come that you guys our symbol, and these crowns will be the reminder of this prophecy that you're a symbol of someone else coming, the branch, right? A memorial in the temple of Jehovah. And they that are afar off shall come and build in the temple of Jehovah. And ye shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass. If you diligently obey the voice of Jehovah your God. Now, guys, pay attention. God just said, Joshua, you're a high priest. And your fellows who serve you, all of you are a wonder, a sign, a symbol of the branch. So what I want you guys to do is make a crown and crown Joshua, the high priest, the son of Jehozadak. Because this high priest is a picture of the branch. This high priest is a royal priest, a priest who rules, because he's going to be a picture of the branch to come. The branch will also be a king and a priest on the throne. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? Do you understand? Joshua, the high priest, is given a crown. You know why that's astonishing? According to the Old Testament, priests are from the line of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. Kings are from the line of David of the tribe of Judah. Zerubbabel, who was working with Joshua and Zechariah to rebuild the temple, he was a descendant of David from Judah, but God didn't say crown Zerubbabel. He said, put the crown on the high priest. Now, for the Jews at that time, they would have been astonished. But wait, 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 Zechariah. Joshua is a Levite. He's from the line of Aaron. Why are you crowning him? You're supposed to crown Zerubbabel. He's from David, from Judah. That's where the kings come from. And Zechariah's answer is, well, that's what God told me. God is saying Joshua, the high priest, he's a picture of the branch. Just like Joshua is a high priest and a king, a royal priest, the branch whom he points to will be a priest and a king, a royal priest, <clears throat> a royal priest and a priestly king on the throne. Really? Yes, really. So this high priest is being crowned because he's a picture of the branch who will be a king who's also a priest, a priestly king, a royal priest. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Everyone with me so far? Did you notice God said Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, he's a picture of the branch, not Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah, where the kings come from. Joshua is from the line of Aaron, a priest from Zadok, the son of Jehozadak, and he's being crowned because he's a picture of the branch. Okay. Now, here's where you're going to get blown away. Joshua is the son of Jehozadak. Josedek in the King James. I'm going to now transliterate it. Yehoshua. Right, Ben. Sorry, I'm trying to translate it correctly. Yehoshua Ben Yeho Zadak. Yehoshua is where we get the word Yehoshua, Yehoshua, Joshua, 
Ben Yeho Zadak. Now, Yehoshua, Yehoshua, or Yehoshua, the shortened form of that name is Yeshua. Yeshua. In fact, in Ezra 3, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2, he's called Yeshua, the shortened form of Yehoshua. Let's go to Ezra 3, verse 2. Watch what's going to happen here, folks. Watch what's going to happen here, folks. Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. Joshua, Yehoshua, is also called Yeshua. Here you go, Ezra 3, verse 2. This is why I love the King James. It captures it. Notice, then stood up Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Okay, did you catch that this high priest, his name is Jesus? Yehoshua, short form is Yeshua, which is Jesus. So notice this high priest, his name is Jesus, and his father's name is Jehovah, who is righteous. Yeho Zadok means Jehovah, who is righteous. So here is Jesus, the son of Jehovah, who is righteous. And he's the picture of the branch. A title that even rabbis admit. Don't take my word for it. Ask the rabbis. The word branch, Simach. Is that a title of Messiah? A messianic title? One of the names of Messiah? Mashiach? They'll say yes. So notice, Jesus, the son of Jehovah, who is righteous, the high priest, is crowned because he's a picture of the Messiah to come. And the Messiah to come, his name is Jesus. And his father is Jehovah, who is righteous. You guys catch it or no? I want it to sink in before I move on. Is it sinking in? Okay. Remember, it says Joshua is a picture of the branch. Now, let me tell you who the branch is. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. And God willing, in my series, I'll unpack this. I'm not going to be able to cover everything in this session. This is to prepare you, whet your appetites for more meat by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6. Remember, it says Joshua is a picture of the branch. Simach. Read here. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord Jehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. There's that word again. But he's coming from David's line. I will raise unto David from David's line the righteous branch, which Joshua thy priest is a picture of. That I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king. You see why Joshua's crowned? Because this branch from David is a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called. Bam! His name is Jehovah, our righteousness. Wow! This branch, this human descendant of David, who is a king, his name will be Jehovah, our righteousness. But Joshua, the high priest, he is crowned because he's a picture of this branch. And Joshua's father is Jehovah who is righteous. So the branch is called Jehovah our righteousness. Joshua, his name is Jesus. And his father is Jehovah who is righteous. I pray he fills me, Muslim XXX. And continues to sanctify me and causes me to love Jesus more and die for Jesus. And give me the power to live for him. Did it sink in or no, guys? Did it sink in? Did you see Joshua, the high priest, son of Jehozadak? His name is Yehoshua and also Yeshua. As the three, two calls him Yeshua, Jeshua. Jesus, our Lord, his name is Yeshua. 
Joshua thy priest is crowned because he's a priest and a king because he's a picture symbol of the branch to come. Who is the branch? Jeremiah tells you. The branch from David, the human descendant of David, whom God raises up to rule on David's behalf. But that human descendant of David, he is named Jehovah, our righteousness. Jesus, our Lord, who claimed to be the Messiah, the son of David, and our high priest, he is the son of Jehozadak, Jehovah, who is righteous. Now, do you see why Joshua was crowned, though he's high priest? Because Joshua becomes a picture that the Messiah is not just the king, he's also a priest. He's a priestly king, a royal priest. Do you see it? So Pan Aji, Panagi, meaning all holy, a title of the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Panagia. Panagia. That's one of the names given to the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ now that she's glorified and perfected in the presence of her son. The beloved mother of our Lord Jesus, whom we love for the sake of Jesus. Panagia. Let me repeat it again. Joshua, the high priest, the son of Jehoz Jehozadak. Joshua's Hebrew name is Yehoshua, and he's also called Yeshua. Ben Yehozadak. Yehozadak means Jehovah is righteous. Are you with me there? So this high priest, his name is Jesus, the son of Jehovah who's righteous, and he's crowned to rule. Why? Because he's a high priest who rules as a picture of the branch. Jeremiah 23 tells us that branch is the son of David, the Messiah, who rules as king, whose name is Jehovah, our righteousness. And is it a coincidence that when Jesus comes, claiming to be that Messiah, the son of David, his name is Jesus, and he claims that Jehovah, who is righteous, is his father. So he is Jesus, Yeshua, Yehoshua, ben Yehozadak, our high priest and king. I want it to sink in before I move to the next point. God willing, I'm going to have to do a part two tomorrow. Who's confused? Anyone confused? But yet, who's blown away by all this meat in scripture, all these hints, all these symbols, all these foreshadowings, of Jesus the Messiah. Then Panagia, I can't help you. If you're not getting it, that's that's not my fault. You're gonna have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Okay, so if everyone's getting it, if everyone's getting it by the grace of God's Spirit. Do you see how the New Testament is employing these methods of interpreting the Hebrew Bible developed by rabbinic Jews to look for prophetic hints, analogies that point to Jesus and his life? Okay, so the New Testament didn't make it up. Even Zechariah told you Joshua is a symbol, a wonder, meaning pointing to something greater, right? Clear? How many are there what? Choose Jesus. I don't, I don't get it. Exactly. If you have eyes to see and hearts open, you cannot help but see that the Bible is supernatural. It is divine. It is mind-blowing. It is the revelation of the true God and the God revealed in it. He is reality. He is real and he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Choose Jesus. What do you mean how many are there? I don't. I don't get it. He asked me, he said, how many are there? I just want to help him. Woo! Choose Jesus. You have 39 Old Testament books filled with allusions to Christ. And I'm going to give you two today. Are you ready? Because I'm going to end part one. And guys, I'm sure you can't wait for part two tomorrow, God willing. Pray for me because I want to do live streams until I leave Wednesday. Guys, you don't understand. This is a major change in my life. I'm doing something I haven't done. I've been living in Chicago since 74. For the first time in my life, I'm leaving my beloved city behind. 
and I'm going to have to leave my daughters behind temporarily. The, after Jesus, my God, they are my heart, and I ache for them. And I'm going to leave them temporarily, trusting Jesus will bring them to me. Folks, because I know Jesus is real, he's alive. I know he loves me, and I pray he keeps me in love with him, and I die for him and never deny him. Though I'm scared, I'm going there by faith, knowing he's already there ahead of me, and he will fight for me. Otherwise, it's over for me, and I can't do ministry. Okay, now... Do you want me to show you how Genesis 1 itself points to Jesus Christ? How Genesis 1 itself points to Jesus Christ? Amen, 1611. We're on our way to heaven because of the grace, the mercy, the blood, the love of Jesus, the life of Jesus. Okay, first let's go to John 1, verses 1 of 5. John 1, verses 1 of 5. And Claudio, if that was you, Jesus is not the Father. They're not the same person. They're different persons who exist as one God because God can be one in one way, but more than one person and still be one God. Don't make God like you, please. I want to love you enough for you to see the fullness of the truth and not spread modalistic heresy. Okay, now read with me. John 1, verses 1 of 5. See, if you're not paying attention, you won't see what John is doing. John 1, verses 1 of 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pay attention, or you're going to miss it. In the beginning, NRK, he starts his gospel with the same Greek words that the Greek translation of Genesis 1 starts with. If you're reading the Greek of Genesis 1, 1, and the Greek of John, it starts the same way. NRK, in NRK. Everyone pronounce it in the Greek. Ach, Erasmus, we love you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now pay attention to verses 4 and 5. Okay, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That life was the light of men. Pay attention to verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, meaning it could not overtake the light. It could not resist the light. It could not thwart the light, right? It could not overcome the light, okay? Did you catch it? In the beginning, light, darkness. In the beginning, light, darkness, right? And did you catch verse 3 and 4? All things were made through the word, Jesus Christ, and nothing has been made without him that has been made. In him was life, right? Do you guys catch it? Okay, now let's go to Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5. Now watch how this is going to point to Jesus. Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5. Now watch how this is going to point to Jesus. Watch here. When you say how many prophetic hints, too many choose Jesus. We haven't even discovered all of them. Now read. In the beginning, same words, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's John 1, 3. All things came into being through him. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Here's the Spirit of God being used by God to create and give life. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, guys, pay attention. I want to see which of you are going to catch it. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. You didn't catch it, did you? John 1, verses 1 of 5, just explained the meaning of Genesis 1, verses 1 of 5. John is telling you the light that God spoke, let there be light, is not the light of the sun and the moon. That comes later in the narrative. That comes on the fourth day. This is the light that John 1 tells you. Issued forth from Jesus to give life and to separate the darkness from light. You understand what John 1 is telling you the meaning of Genesis is? The darkness represents no life. The light is the life that Jesus gave, that creative energy, that creative force that issued forth from Jesus 
to give life to the world that was in darkness, to free it from its darkness, meaning no life. No, light is not Jesus. You're not catching it. The light is the creative energy, the creative power, the creative force that issued forth from Jesus to give life to a world that was devoid of light because it was in darkness. He is not the light. The light is the power that springs from him. The life-giving power. Because notice what it says. In him was life. And that is the life that energizes creation, that makes creation livable, right, habitable, <clears throat> separating it from its darkness. You with me there? But then... John gives you a deeper meaning of the creation account. Okay, what's the deeper meaning that John wants you to see? That darkness that enveloped the earth, enveloped the earth, though it's a physical darkness, it points to something else. That darkness points to spiritual darkness, a spiritual darkness that will overshadow creation later on in the narrative that only the light of Christ separates you from. So let me unpack the meat of Genesis 1 and how it points to Jesus. The physical light, the physical darkness, physical day, physical night are intended to point to something greater. Spiritual light, spiritual day, spiritual darkness, right? Spiritual night. And just like the light was separated from the darkness, those who are of the light must be separated from those who are of the darkness. Those who belong to the day must be separated from those who belong to the night. So what you have in Genesis is a physical creation. Embedded within it are hints to something spiritual, something greater that the Bible, specifically the New Testament, unfolds and unpacks. Are you with me there? And King of Kings, you see because of the light of Jesus. Let me prove it to you. It said light, day, darkness, night. And they were separate, right? He separated the light from the darkness and he called the light day and he called the darkness night, right? So light and darkness have to be separate. Right? Did you get that point so I can unpack the meat? Light, day, darkness, night, light separate from darkness. They cannot coexist. Now, let me show you what the New Testament does with this language. You ready? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Let's see if you catch it. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Jeremy caught it. Now, watch what's going to happen. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Watch what the New Testament does to this Genesis account of physical creation. It takes the physical creation and brings out a spiritual application. Okay? But be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Communion with light and darkness. Light represents righteousness. Darkness represents unrighteousness. What concord? Hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Did you catch it? Light versus darkness. Righteousness versus unrighteousness. Christ versus Belial. The temple of God versus idols. But then let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 verses 4 to 6. Second Corinthians 4, verses 4 to 6.
Watch here. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Notice what Paul did. He just took the Genesis 1 account of creation and then spiritualized it. That light is the light that shines out of the darkness to bring us out of darkness. Hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See what he just did with it? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now notice verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When did he do that? Genesis 1, right? Hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You skip verse 4. See, i got to smash this guy's face in. He quoted 6 twice. But I guess in his Bible, there is no four. I got to bust this guy's face and repent. Okay. What happened to four, buddy? Thank you, Jeremy. And I received that. If God has put in your heart to want to contribute to my PayPal to help me to on my way because I'm driving for two days, I'd appreciate it. God bless you. 2 Corinthians 4.4. In whom the God of this world blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Did you see what Paul just did with the language of Genesis 1? See what he just did with Genesis 1? He said that light and darkness point to something greater. The physical light, the physical darkness point to spiritual light, spiritual darkness. Darkness being a picture of what's to come. Satan, his evil, his destruction. And the light of the revelation of Jesus who sets us free from the bondage of Satan. You caught it? Everyone catch this or no? Are you Did you get lose the point? Do you see how Genesis 1 choose Jesus and everyone else? Even Genesis 1 is a picture of Christ, his gospel, destroying Satan and his kingdom of darkness. Choose Jesus, see that too? Yeah, block him free. He's not listening. But wait, you're still not convinced? 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Watch here. It's going to get better. Wait. Watch this happening. And you're telling me this book is not from God, the Quran is, or the Vedas. Or no, let's be atheists. The Bible is proof that God exists. The Bible is proof that God exists and Christ is risen. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 10. But of the times, pay attention now. Paul is going to now quote Genesis. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, day of the Lord, cometh as a thief in the night. Jesus is the day that comes and destroys the night. Pay attention to the language. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. An allusion to Genesis 3, 16, the woman who gives birth in labor pains. Genesis 3, 16. Hmm, are you catching this? The allusions to Genesis? And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day... Hmm. should overtake you as a thief. Now watch. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Whoa, Paul, what are you doing here? We're children of light, children of day, not of the night, not of the darkness. Woman in travail. Are you taking Genesis 1 to 3 and spiritualizing it? Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, because we are not of the night. Day is separate from the night. Light is separate from darkness, right? Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. <clears throat> we... Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Okay, did you catch it? Did he not just take the light, the day, the night, the, the darkness, the night of Genesis 1, 
and the woman giving birth in labor pains of Genesis 3, did he not just take all of that and spiritualize it and apply it to us? Do you see what he does do with Genesis 1? Are you getting it or no? I don't know if you're getting it. Okay. You see, John's gospel does it. Paul did in 2 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians. They took the Genesis account of physical creation and saw Jesus in it and saw spiritual insights in it and saw the gospel in it. Now, when you read Genesis 1, you have to read it from a different perspective. See the light, not just as, as the light, that creative energy and life-giving power from Jesus to animate the earth that's been engulfed by lifelessness because darkness represents lifelessness. But it's also meant to point to spiritual life, right? You're getting it now? I want to make sure it sinks in. No, you're going to have to go back and listen to the live stream again because I don't think I've written an article with this depth. Okay? I don't think I have. Okay, now, more examples of the Genesis account of creation being spiritualized for us. Okay? John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 21. We're almost done, folks. John 3, 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world. Men love darkness. Notice the earth is again engulfed by darkness like it was in Genesis. Are you catching this? The earth that was engulfed in darkness physically is now engulfed in darkness spiritually. And the same light that set free the physical earth from its darkness is the same light that's setting free the earth from its spiritual darkness. Okay. Are you catching what's being done with the Genesis account of creation? Right. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil for any, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God, that God produced those works in you. So did you catch what John just did? That physical earth that was engulfed in physical darkness, that was then set free and made alive by that physical light or the creative power and energy that came from Jesus, the creator, right? is now engulfed in spiritual darkness and requires the same light of that same creator, the Son of God, to set it free from its spiritual darkness. Everyone got it? So did you catch it? Darkness of Genesis 1, night of Genesis 1, points to Satan, to evil, to corruption, to destruction, to the kingdom of darkness. Right? Now, go to Ephesians 6.12 real quickly because I'm going to tie it in. We're almost done because I got to end it now. Ephesians, and I'll do God willing part two tomorrow. Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There it goes again. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Did you catch it? Like the physical earth was engulfed in physical darkness. The earth again is engulfed in darkness, but spiritual darkness. Satan and his kingdom. And where are these evil rulers? These evil, unclean rulers, these spirit beings, these demons, they're in heavenly places, right? In heavenly places, correct? Right? Right? Ephesians 6, 12? Just want to make sure you get it. 
Acts 26, 18. We're almost done. Watch what's going to happen here. Oh, it's going to get better, King of Kings. And then, Lord willing, there's part two tomorrow. Wait till for tomorrow. Acts 26, 18. Watch here. To Jesus speaking to Paul, when Jesus appeared to Paul, Jesus speaking, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light. There is the imagery again. Darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Did you catch it again? Darkness to light. Darkness to light. Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. So I'm trying to set it up for the icing of the cake, for the bam and the boom and the kaboom. Colossians 1.13. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There it goes again. Darkness. Right? Now notice what Jesus says in Luke 22.53 when they're coming to arrest him. Luke 22.53. Watch. Luke 22, 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So notice, New Testament took that physical act of creation and spiritualized it. That physical light, physical day, is spiritual light, spiritual day, pointing to Jesus Christ our Lord, his kingdom, his gospel that saves us from darkness. That physical darkness, physical night, is now spiritual darkness, spiritual night, pointing to Satan, to his evil demons, his, his kingdom of darkness that destroys, that corrupts, that perverts. So that physical earth that was engulfed in physical darkness is now the earth that's engulfed in spiritual darkness. And just like the light set free the physical earth from its physical darkness and made it livable, habitable, gave it life, that same light now sets people free from the spiritual darkness that engulfs the earth, giving them spiritual life, regeneration, and immortality. You with me there? Is it clear? So now... These evil beings are in the heavenly realms because here's what I want you to catch. And here's the icing on the cake. Genesis chapter one, we're going to read verses three to eight. Genesis one, verses three to eight. Pay attention, meditate, astute readers, pay attention to see what you're going to not find in these events. Genesis one, three to eight. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now notice what he says about the light. Keep reading. Pay attention. And God saw the light that it was good. So he called the light good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Pay attention now. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So he, he, he separated light darkness and said first day. Pay attention. And God called the light day and darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now notice this. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Guys, do you know that th these are the only two places where God doesn't call something good? When he separated the light from the darkness, he didn't call it good. And when he created the heaven, he didn't call it good. He didn't call it bad, but he didn't call it good. Every other act, he calls it good. Do you know that? Do you know that when it comes to darkness being separated from light, he didn't say, and it was good, day one. When he created the heaven, it was good, right, day two. Right? Didn't call it good and didn't see it, didn't look at it and say he saw it was good. You know why? Because again, the prophetic hint. Since darkness represents evil 
And evil originated from heaven because Satan was a heavenly being. Here you see another prophetic hint that these are the two places where he doesn't say it was good because from these would come evil, which is bad. Another hint that you need the light of the New Testament to see. Another hint that you need the light of the New Testament to see. He called the light good, but when he separated light from darkness, he didn't say it. he saw it was good or it, he called it good. Created heaven, didn't see, say he saw it was good or call it good. Every other thing he says, it was good. He saw it was good. It was good. He saw it was good. Because the New Testament now illuminates our reading of Genesis 1 to see. The reason why is because darkness and heaven, these are the two places in which evil came from. A prophetic hint of something deeper, something bigger, something spiritual. Exactly, Dilajan. Not only did he know it would happen, but Moses is writing this after the fact, after it happened. So you see how all of it points to Jesus Christ, to his gospel, to his perfect life, his death, his salvation, his grace, his love, his mercy. His restoration of the earth and setting it free from darkness. All of it points to Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you guys ready for part two tomorrow, God willing? Tomorrow Saturday, but I should be free. Right? And don't take my word for it. Read Genesis 1. Explain to me why when he created heaven, it didn't say and he saw it was good or it called it good. And explain to me why after he called the light good and separated from darkness, it didn't say that. He saw that separation as good or called it good. But for every other creative act, he said he saw it was good. Right? Why? Because the New Testament will tell us, in light of what I just showed you, darkness, night, represents Satan as kingdom. How can that be good? And these evil beings are in the heavenly realms wrecking havoc on earth. So it's from heaven that this evil came. How can that be good? Lord willing, are you guys up for a live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Canadian Time, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6 p.m.? Can you guys do it tomorrow? Because Andrew's asking me because he's from Australia. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. That's Canadian time. So God willing, I'll try to be on at that time because I want to get out early because it's a Saturday night. And I want to go hit the town and party. Just kidding. I don't party. No. As Christians, you are not to believe in seven heavens. There are only three heavens. Don't fall for this rabbinic Jewish tradition or Muslim tradition. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, Angelo says there are three heavens. The sky, the sky, right? Sky, the, the space. Then the... the when I say space, sky, the atmosphere, the sky above us where the birds fly, then space, and then this heavenly dimension where God dwells with angels and disembodied believers are perfected in Christ. Second Corinthians 12, 2 to 4. No, the Jewish sources are only correct when the New Testament confirms them. For the Christian anyway. Anyway, guys, pray for my travels. Like I said, this is a scary thing to leave my hometown behind. My angels behind, trusting God will bring them because I love and adore them. I only love Jesus more than them, and I miss them. You don't know how much I miss them. Pray for them. God, bless me and just destroy these attacks of the enemy and have them in my life. Pray because I'm going to be driving for two days, thousands of miles. Pray for safety, for provision. Pray for miraculous blessings there that I start teaching locally there. For the support for ministry to come in, continue to do this work. Pray I get healthier. And if God is pleased, if he wants me to be single, his will be done. God is pleased and he has a godly woman to make her known to me. 
a woman who will be a blessing to spread the kingdom, not a hindrance, and pray God will save me from those kind of women, right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Save us and keep us pure and holy in love with you. Provide for all our needs. Provide for my daughters. Please, Lord, protect us and fight for us against this corrupt system. And keep us safe from the evil one and bring them to me, Father. Bring them to me, Lord Jesus. Bring them to me, Holy Spirit, and bless your people and convict Andrew to fall in love with Jesus over again and to live for Jesus. And help us to never doubt you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Folks, if you want to contribute to, to my traveling, God bless you. You can do so on PayPal or you can do so on Patreon. Contact me. Traveling expenses, we we'll, we'll appreciate and blessing. And pray God will save the money he's given me from these corrupt judges that they don't touch it in Jesus' name. Okay, guys, Lord willing, see you tomorrow, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. God willing, part two of this. There's a lot more meat, God willing by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Take care.